Well, we're going to continue this morning. Uh, I'm going to conclude, actually, on the topic we've been sharing and uh, mention a slightly different aspect of what we've been speaking of in the area of deliverance. Now, I know when I say deliverance for some folks in some Christian circles, they get really, really nervous, and maybe they had bad experiences or whatever. But all deliverance simply means is just experiencing freedom at a point in our life where maybe we have given in to the enemy's lies, where we have allowed sin, just some area that seems to be worn down in our heart where the Lord has intended abundance. And so the Lord just wants to set us free, and he wants us to walk in freedom. And if we're going to walk in freedom for the rest of our walk with the Lord, then we're going to have to experience ongoing freedom from time to time. Um, I've been so encouraged uh, these last few weeks, actually, of just hearing back from a number of people uh, who have experienced just a new level of freedom or a new level of understanding, and uh, they've really experienced the Lord doing something special in their life. So that, that's always encouraging. Because uh, sometimes we can, as we've been sharing the last couple of weeks, we can give the enemy a foothold in our life. And if not dealt with, that foothold, that little fish hook, actually becomes a stronghold from which the enemy is able to kind of hide and do other things or influence other areas or ways of thinking. And a foothold, as you see here in the definition, is simply this. It's a secured position from which further progress can be made. You may remember we talked about how, how the Holy Spirit works in our lives as followers of Christ. And that is, just like he brought the people of Israel into the land of the promised land, he said, I'll give you a little bit at a time until your numbers increase and you learn how to possess, occupy what it is I've given to you. And we experience that principle. We grow in the Lord. He shows us things. We live in those things for a while. We begin to possess that area of our life. We understand who we are, how life is meant to work. And the Lord says, okay, now you're ready for a little more. And so we continue to advance and expand that fullness that the Lord wants for our lives. Well, the enemy works the same way because he is spirit as well. And what he tries to do is establish a hook or a foothold in our life, and if we allow him to, or if we never deal with it, never challenge it, then once he occupies that area of thinking or the way of getting us to behave or the lies to believe, then he will begin to try and take more and more territory or maybe even you know, delude us in a way that we allow kind of other spiritual entities to impact our lives. Hope this isn't freaking you out if you're visiting for the first time. Uh, go over the last couple Sunday messages and you'll have more of a foundation. So we're kind of jumping in here toward the end. But uh, that's just a principle we see in the realm of the Spirit. I found it really interesting, quite saddening, actually. I was speaking with uh, a denominational leader, a Christian leader, just this past week. And he mentioned how that they are planning a conference for their pastors. And it's actually going to be a conference that's going to focus on deliverance ministry. They're going to offer deliverance for pastors, freedom. But they also want to get pastors freed up so they can go back home and minister freedom to their people. But what I found disheartening was the fact that the, uh, this denominational leader said, he said, Paul, he said, in our promotion material, he said, I can't use the word deliverance. I've got to call it something else because I realize a lot of pastors might stay away if we talk about deliverance. So that's unfortunate, and, but it does explain why so many believers in the body of Christ, they continue to live with these lingering bondages in their lives, some small, some great, because we're afraid to actually broach the subject, sometimes because of some crazy stuff over the years that has been done well-intentioned, but maybe not biblically based, and so we've kind of thrown the baby out with the bathwater. But like I said, all deliverance is is freedom. And the Lord intends freedom for us all on all different levels. So I'm not going to take time to recap what I shared the last couple of weeks, except to simply remind us that although the devil's power was destroyed at the cross of Jesus Christ, in terms of any authority that he had over people, or has over us rather, though his authority has been destroyed through Christ and we have authority over him, he still has the ability to deceive us. In any area of life that we believe his lies, he has an opportunity to establish a stronghold and to basically try to wear us down. So we all need freedom if we're growing with the Lord at different stages of our spiritual growth so that we can be, as the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, that we can be useful to the Master. I believe you probably feel the same way I do, that I'm thankful for my salvation and having been so gloriously saved and set free, now I want to be useful to the one who saved me. Right? I don't want to be shut down and just kind of live as if someone who believes what he says, but kind of lives my own way, my old way, because I'm kind of used to living in the flesh. <clears throat> in fact, it's James who says in chapter 3, verse 11, he asked the question, is it possible for clean water and dirty water or for sweet water and bitter water to flow from a fountain at the same time? 
No, it's not possible, you see? So there's things the Lord wants to minister through us. There's a flow that he wants to pour through us because he lives within us, but he can't pour through us at the same time or in the same dimensions that he wants to if what is coming from me or what is maybe held up in me is that, you might say, bitter water or just kind of the works of enemy in, our, in, our, in my life. We all know probably what it's been like from time to time when you want to minister or you find yourselves in a situation where, oh, Lord, I, I, I want to you know, be able to share with this person or believe for this or pray for that. And then sometimes something comes to our mind that shuts us down, like, no, nah, I can't step out because I still have this lingering thing in my life. I feel disqualified. Now, it's not that the Lord can't minister, but the Lord wants to free us from uh, those attacks so that we are able to, to be useful to the Master. So I want to say from the outset, and this is where I kind of want to uh, broach a different topic here that's related to what we've been sharing the last couple weeks, but I want to say this morning that I have found over some 50-odd years of walking with the Lord that the greatest challenge to me in walking with Christ has not been demons. It's not been the devil. It's been me. Imagine that. You would not believe that. But it's true. Dealing with my pride, right, my unbelief, my apathy, my personality, whatever it may be, those are the things that oftentimes I find that I'm dealing with. Now, one good thing when you're dealing with the spiritual or dealing with the demonic, if there is such a good thing, is that we have the authority to cast the enemy out. We have the authority to uh, recognize where he's working to renounce that or minister to someone themselves who's been demonized and to see that broken instantly so we can cast out demons. But I've had a real hard time with casting myself out. I don't know if you find that, right? That's kind of difficult. How do I cast myself out? Well, the reality is we can't. We can cast out demons, but then we read in Galatians 5 what we are to do. Paul said this. Read it with me. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Okay? So as the people of God, people in whom the Spirit of God lives, we can cast out demons, but we have to learn to crucify our flesh. You see, you can cast out demons in an instant, but it doesn't happen instantly when it comes to crucifying our flesh. That is something that begins to lose a strength in our life as we learn to walk in obedience to what God shows us. Uh, we talk about this in the ministry of cleansing stream, but when we talk about deliverance, we talk about spiritual maturity. To me, the essence of spiritual maturity is simply this. How long does it take you to obey the Lord? It's that simple. How long does it take you to submit to the Holy Spirit when he's speaking to you? That will show you how mature you are. Whether you're still an infant, whether you're still dealing with stuff that kids deal with, spiritually speaking, or whether or not you are mature in the Lord. And so we talk about deliverance from ourself, but deliverance from self requires self-discipline. Self-discipline. It was Abraham Lincoln who said, if you ask me to cut down a tree in six hours, I'll spend the first four hours sharpening my axe. And so that's what discipline is. That's the essence of it. There are things the Lord will show us, but where many of us oftentimes fail is the Lord will show us what he wants to do in our lives, but because it requires discipline, we don't want to do it, right? It requires effort. It's kind of like going to the gym, spiritually speaking, not really feeling it, Lord. So we kind of learn to tolerate those things. When the Lord comes to us with passion, he comes to us with a promise and with a word, and he shows us what can be done. The Lord's not trying to frustrate you or me. When we're in his presence worshiping him, whatever kind of week we've come from or whatever it is that we're struggling with sometimes, he's not trying to frustrate us when he drops a, a word of hope in our heart or just his presence. We say, oh, Lord, I want freedom. Lord, I want you. I want to be free from this stuff. That's not the goodness of your heart. That's the Holy Spirit giving you a taste of the freedom that he has for you. But he can't force you to be free. You have to decide whether or not you want to leave that what's behind and, and step into what it is the Lord has you. But he's given you a taste of what it is that he has for you. And so because very few of us actually enjoy discipline, we find in church circles sometimes it's more easy to talk about deliverance from the demonic than it actually is deliverance from ourselves. Jesus said, in fact, in Matthew chapter 6, that if the light within you is darkness... Or if it becomes darkness, how great is that darkness? How great is that darkness? Any area of my life where I surrender control to the enemy or control to sin, I need to understand that it doesn't matter what I think is a big sin, small thing, big demon, small demon. The enemy comes for the same reason, to steal, kill, and destroy. 
And what he will do through the smallest of things that I give entry to is that he will begin as best he can from that point to systematically dis dismantle my life, to begin to undo things where the Lord wants to be established and steadfast and confident and clear-minded. He wants to begin to bring fogginess and, and a lack of clarity and a lack of confidence. But you see, the beautiful things Jesus says is, I've given you disciplines. And a discipline, as we've said many times before, is not a hardship. A discipline simply means putting certain things into practice so that I'm able to accomplish through training what I presently can't do through trying. So we can be sincere as we want, saying, oh, I'd love to try to do that. The Lord says you can, but are you willing to train? It's the same principle in the natural life in which we live, right? A lot of good people intend to lose weight. A lot of good people intend to get into shape. A lot of people, whatever it may be, right? It's not that you and I can't do it, but will you discipline yourself? Is the goal worth the sacrifice? You have to determine that. Or are you content to live with the alternative, which might be premature sickness, death, whatever it is. And so the Lord gives us that option. He comes to us to give us the hope of life and show us how to walk in that way. And some of those disciplines, of course, they, they, they involve communion with God, reading God's word, fasting, praying in the spirit, worship, praise, so many things. But all the things the Lord gives us by way of disciplines, they actually restore and they restore those areas where the enemy has been wearing us down. Now, another important principle to understand <clears throat> is that spiritual strongholds can be uh, established in my life through my own sin, but they can also come into my life through the sins of another, especially people who have influence in my life or people who have authority in my life. Uh, one of the important life lessons my wife taught me uh, as, a, as parents in, in the early years was the thoughtfulness and, and the measuredness of her responses to our boys. She always spoke to them in a calm way, in a caring way. Even if it was something that was, that was serious or stressful, uh, she just had a way of kind of breaking it down and communicating that in a calmness that, that didn't hurt them. And, you know, when I think back to those years, I realize that as parents, we actually have more potential than the devil himself to harm our kids. We really do. Uh, we, we, are, uh, we just have this potential to sow things into their lives by the way we speak to them, by the looks that we give to them, by the cold shoulder or the condemnation or the accusation, whatever it may be. So we really need to be careful and be led by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Proverbs 18 that death and life are in the power of the tongue. You see, the words that we speak as parents, they go deep into the souls of our children. And our words and our behaviors toward them, they either create hope and life and help children even face some of the lies that they encounter in their school and their, among their friends and they can bring healing, or we can speak words of death that go into their heart and actually rob them of hope, that suffocate their soul, that actually scar them for many, many years to come. And those are things, by the way, you may be sitting here and some of those things come to your mind. I encourage you, take those to the Lord and ask the Lord how he would have you to deal with those things. It may be something you have to ask forgiveness for, and not only from him, but to sit down with your child and say, honey, I just felt the Lord bring something to my mind. I really want to clear the ear. I just want us together to uproot anything, any way the enemy has used that word or that experience to hurt you. You know, somebody once said that sticks and stones may break my bones, but what? Names will never hurt me, right? It sounds good, but that person probably never grew up being called stupid, never grew up being called useless or ugly. Whatever it may be, words have great power in our lives, especially those who have influence in our lives. So we've been talking about the reality of the spirit realm, the reality of the demonic, and we haven't done that to be sensational. We've done that to be aware that we have an enemy whose success depends on one thing. It depends on remaining hidden in our lives. So he's able to work from places in a clandestine kind of way. And we know that in our society, they depict the devil in foolish ways. They kind of, you know, communicate the devil as this guy who wears red pajamas and a pitchfork and little horns, you know. And we realize as Christians that's foolishness, but I think we need to understand as Christians that we can be just as naive when we address issues in our life purely on the human level, purely on the natural level. And we don't understand that some of those situations, attitudes, whatever it may be, that some of those things have actually been demonically masterminded for our lives. That's why Paul said we are not ignorant, unaware of the enemy's schemes. At least we shouldn't be. And if we are unaware, then that's, of course, where we, where we suffer the greater casualty. Now, these issues oftentimes begin in the natural. We all go through life, and, and sometimes life throws us the curveball, or sometimes we get blindsided, things happen. 
So they begin in the natural, but here's what happens. Even though it happens in the natural, if I respond to it in the flesh, rather than responding in the spirit, in other words, if I respond or react in a way that is not led of the Holy Spirit, is not Christ-like, is not according to the Word of God, but just gives place to my flesh, my feelings, it's in my fleshliness that I allow the enemy to have an entry point into my life. And again, for those who weren't here the last couple of weeks, we're not talking about demon possession in the sense of, for those who watched The Exorcist, and I hope you didn't, <clears throat> I actually participated in some deliverance ministries for people who had. So uh, if you have, talk to me later. We'll get you set free. But uh, so we're not talking about that kind of imagery. The word possessed, actually in the scripture, means to be demonized. And it means that we can give the enemy different degrees of influence or control in and through our lives, dependent on the things that we will or will not actually deal with as the Lord shows us. Now, we talk about the entry point. Usually I've found over the years that where people are most susceptible to demonic manipulations are in times when we're going through either transition or we're going through trauma. For example, in trauma, it can be the death of a loved one. It can be a divorce, whether you're going through the divorce or your parents or your children are, are, are losing their parents through divorce. Uh, it can be times of deep hurt, times of deep disappointment. You can imagine different things when trauma hits us. Also, times of transition, uh, when we're going through changes physiologically, when we're going through uh, different seasons of our life. You know, for children, it could be in times when they're changing schools and some of the fears that, that come along with that. It may be through puberty. We're seeing it manifest in our culture today. Our children are most vulnerable to so many forces today when they're going through all these changes of puberty and being told to build of lies, something that they are that they're not and vice versa. And there's such confusion and destruction in the lives of our children. Why? Because it's a time of transition. It's a time of great vulnerability with all the hormones and flux and everything going on. It can also be in times of pregnancy, menopause, midlife, all those different things. Now you say, what's so important about that? Well, here's what I've found over the years is that these seasons are natural. I'm not saying that they're bad, but because they involve so much of our emotion and, and, and just sometimes our emotions are so raw when we're going through these times is the devil is able to, if we allow him to slip into those times and to try to create a stronghold in the way that we think or believe so that as we go through these things and go through some terrible emotions or maybe it impacts relationships or whatever, we come to expect that as normal. You see the difference? It's not that those things don't happen, but we expect the way we react or the way the other react as just being the normal thing. And so we expect unhappiness. We expect despair. It's just a natural part of these challenging experiences when they may have nothing to do with what is actually going on. So we have to be aware of that as the people of God. You see, as the people of God, I understand what our culture is going through, and I understand all the pressures that people allow to get placed upon them, especially those who don't know Christ. There's this great spirit of, of hopelessness and stress and anxiety in our culture today. But even as believers sometimes, we give place to syndromes. We give place to syndromes of depression or dysfunction. We believe lies like, well, all marriages have their ups and downs. All marriages go through bad spots. All teenagers rebel. All teenagers sow their wild oats. All teenagers go through these things. You can apply it to different areas of your life, but do you understand what I'm saying? We come to believe the lie of the culture, which, by the way, is not led by Jesus. It's led by the spirit of this world, right? And that's what the spirit of this world says is normal. And Jesus says, no, it's not normal. I know you're going through this, but if you believe that lie, your culture, the spirit of the culture, is trying to sell you an acceptable name for bondage. And don't receive it. Don't believe it. It doesn't mean that you're not experiencing some real things. Pressures, physiological changes, all that kind of stuff. That's not it. But he says, listen, you've got to understand, there is freedom in Jesus. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is with you in every single season. And even if there are some changes and life changes, these things that are going on, you need to understand you can walk through those seasons, not with fear, but with faith, that in those times you can actually draw close to Jesus. Jesus. 
In those times, you can grow in your strength. They are opportunities for your faith to be a living faith, for the Lord to show himself to you and to bring you through, even with joy. That's the difference the Lord makes. I'm not saying feel condemnation if you ever you know, struggle with any of these things. We can all struggle in these seasons, but we don't just give ourselves to them. I don't just say to my wife, I treat you like dirt because, well, you know, I'm just going through this thing. Well, go through it with Jesus and love your wife. There's a difference. We have options. And so we need to stop expecting certain things that we go through. And if some things do come our way, then we take the Lord's hand and we say, Lord, will you walk me through this? So that as I'm going through this valley, Lord, I know you are with me. As I'm going through this time, I can still be like Christ. In the midst of it, I can still honor you. I can still grow. I can still learn from you and not just write it off as something that's just automatic. Now, G, uh, John writes about Jesus' visit to Jerusalem for the Passover festival in chapter 2. And when he gets to Jerusalem in the temple, at the temple, he finds all these money changers. And so John writes this about Jesus. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and cattle. And he poured out the coins, the money changers, of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. You see, it was just a few weeks before that Jesus was baptized in water and officially began his ministry. And the first act that Jesus performs as the anointed, now we know he worked a miracle at the wedding of Canaan, but his first act as the anointed of God was what? It was to cleanse the Father's house. He was fulfilling Psalm 69 in which he wrote, Lord, passion for your house has consumed me. What's he talking about this passion? He's saying, I have this fervent desire that the house of my father be restored to its purpose. That it restored to its purpose. That the people of God derive the benefits from what it means to actually uh, be in the house of God. And saints, we need to understand, for those of us who know Jesus, that when Jesus Christ comes to us, he comes to us with passion. He comes to us with fervent desire to drive out of our life every trace of darkness. He is not content for any sin to remain in me. He's not content for me to be bound as his people. He comes with a fervency, and he says, this is not what you were made for. You were made to be the dwelling place of God, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. You don't need to tolerate this stuff anymore. You see, we talked about a couple weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, that the definition of demonized literally is a demon-caused passivity. A demon-caused passivity. That's what demonized is. That's why demons are allowed to have their way in many believers' lives, while they're allowed to have those hooks. And what Jesus is saying is, listen, when I come to you, you need to get rid of that passivity. There's got to be something in your heart that cries out to God and says, Lord, I don't want to be passive in this area anymore. This is not good for me. It's not, I don't want this flowing through me. I don't want this attitude anymore. I shared my testimony before. I'm not going to go into great, great detail. But there was a time early in our marriage when I was just a moody person. Whenever I would get upset, I would just kind of take it onto my wife and just be moody. I could go two or three days just not talking to her, just walking by. And I know none of you have experienced this. Y'all got perfect marriages. But, you know, walking by the hall, and she didn't know what was going on. It was just Paul's in a mood again. And then the Lord showed me once, especially when the boys came along, and he showed me this is demonic. This is not just something you rationalize because it makes sense. Vanessa did this or something happened, so I'm just upset, so I'm moody. You've got to understand, this is a demonic stronghold. It is also a generational sin because it began to show me in my family where that same moodiness was there. I began to see how the enemy worked and how that even got passed on to me. The sins of another, one who has influence or authority over your life. And I had to come to the place and said, Lord, I hate this. It stinks. I don't want my boys growing up in this. And I had to get down on the old prayer bones and repent of my sin, what I had given place to. And it doesn't even mean it was something that I was looking for. But once I acknowledged it, I said, Lord, I don't want this. This does not belong in my life. And the Lord broke that. The Lord changed that. But there had to be a sense of desperation. Friends, hear me. If you want to be free, you've got to be desperate. It doesn't mean that you have to earn it or work for it, but there has to be an attitude in your heart that says, Lord, I'm tired of that. 
And not just saying you're tired of it, but Lord, I will begin to move into the disciplines that you show me in order to give me the tools to crucify that thing once and for all. It may take a few weeks, months, who knows, but if you're walking with the Lord, he will bring you from freedom to freedom, increased freedom, and you will find over time the enemy eventually will lose his grip in that area of your life, and you are free. But you've got to be desperate. You got to be desperate. Hear me, friends. You can come to the altar. I go to conferences. I go to the altar. I want to have somebody pray for me. Hear me. Nobody else can be desperate for you. Nobody else. They can pray for you. They can have the anointing all over them, but nothing's going to change in your heart or mind until we are desperate, that we are hungry and thirsty that we are searching for God with all of our heart. And again, it's not because we're earning anything, but as we begin to apply the disciplines, like just like going to a spiritual gym, you begin, you're saying, how are you gonna fit the gym in this sermon? <laughs> it's like a spiritual gym though. You give yourself to the disciplines the Lord has given you, and what are you doing? As you continue to walk with the Lord, I'm going this way, I'm breaking off the pull of this, I'm gonna commune with God if I don't have prayer time, I'm gonna get in the word of God if I've not been reading the scriptures, I'm gonna learn how to fast and pray, I'm gonna learn what worship is really all about, surround myself with God's thoughts and God's worship, get rid of all that other junk music that's feeding me lies, I'm gonna keep walking this way and you keep pulling and eventually it just gets easier and easier and easier and easier and eventually you're just running, you're running. And that will apply to different areas of our life at different seasons. I've been walking with the Lord for over 50 years, and I can tell you, as soon as you get free, you enjoy that area for a while, and then the Holy Spirit just gently touches on the shoulder and says, you ready for the next one? <laughs> you mean there's more? I'm not the perfect husband yet. <laughs> you know, I'm almost dead. Poor Vanessa. There's still work on me. So the Lord wants to bring that increasing revelation and increasing freedom. But I have to be hungry. I have to be desperate. Paul said, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. What does that mean? That means you can be as close to Jesus as you want to be. He can't get any closer to you. He lives inside you. What more can he do? He lives inside me. It's up to me to turn to him and say, Lord, I want to live with you. I want to abide with you. I want to grow in you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if, it, if it really is, I know we believe that, then he's got tables he wants to turn over in our lives as well. There's demonic money changes that set up their tables in our life, and they just try to exploit us and to turn our hearts from God. You see, when Jesus arrived on the scene in Israel, the temple was no longer a place of, of preparing, people God, for, for preparing the people of God to encounter the Messiah. It had become this noisy, smelly old place that, that basically worship was exhausting, and people just went through the motions. They came to the temple to actually get right with God, but they were taken advantage of, and they left the temple unchanged. And so Jesus' anger was not against those who came to worship God. It was against the thieves who occupied a place where they didn't belong. And it's the perfect picture of a child of God whose temple is cluttered with unclean spirits that will manipulate you and make a mockery of your worship to God. Jesus wants to cleanse us and restore us to our original purpose as the dwelling place of God. In fact, the animals that were being sacrificed or offered, as you know, they were animals that were the weakest, they were the sickliest, but you see, the people still bought them. So it wasn't totally the money changers' fault either. I mean, the money changers set up the lie, but the people could have brought animals. They could have gone somewhere else and said, no, these don't even qualify. I'm going somewhere else and getting a lamb without blemish. But see, they just bought them and offered them for sacrifice because it showed where their hearts were too. And so even as the people of God, they went through the motions at the temple, but there was no confidence that their sins were forgiven or that they would receive anything from the Lord. And friends, when the devil is allowed to set up shop in the marketplace of our mind and our heart, he will use those strongholds to create a lot of noise. A lot of noise. Noise that makes it difficult to think, to hear God's voice, to experience any kind of spiritual depth. But when Jesus comes to us, what does he say? He says, my peace I give to you come to give you peace. He sees the storms in our minds, in our lives, our relationship with the enemy is created, the lives we've bought into. And like the storm on the Sea of Galilee, he says, peace, be still, quiet, hush. And we can begin to hear him again. The freedom that the Lord has for us, we need to understand it comes from the word of God and it comes from the work of the Holy Spirit. Friends, we need to understand this morning that if you do not read God's word, you'll never be free. It's that simple. Whatever your excuse or my excuse may be, 
you will never be free from bondage. It is only the word of God that actually has the light that is able to expose what it is that the enemy is doing in our lives. Or if you know the difference, but you choose not to deal with it, you need to understand it's not an innocuous thing. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you about something over and over and over again to the point that you don't hear him anymore, it's not because he's given up on you. You just stop hearing him. You know why? Because when we continue to disobey, our conscience in that area becomes seared. And seared doesn't mean cut off. Seared means cauterized. When you take something hot, it becomes hardened. And we become hardened in that area, not because the Lord's not speaking. We just don't hear him now because we're hard. We're, in, we're insensitive to the voice of the Spirit again. And the Lord wants to restore that responsiveness, that tenderness to our hearts. Hebrews 4.12, read it with me. The Word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts all the way through to where the soul and spirit meet. It judges the thoughts and intents the heart. That word soul is really interesting. We know what it is. We talked about the last couple of weeks. The soul is that center of us that involves our emotions, our feelings, our will. The word soul is actually the Greek word suke. It's from suke that we get our English word psychology that deals with behavior or psychiatry that deals with mental disorders or with emotional disorders. It's that same origin. So what that means is that it's not a coincidence that the most common entry point of the demonic in our lives is through experiences that involve our emotions. That's why you have to be so careful. The scripture says, be angry, but don't sin. There's nothing wrong with being angry about the right thing. But when you allow anger to overtake your emotions, when you allow hurt to overtake your emotions, when you accept depression as the norm, when you take offense as the norm, you need to understand you're given entry to the enemy. But you see, God's word has the power to cut all the way through to where the soul and the spirit meet. God's word is able to show you where the enemy is controlling your thoughts and your feelings, and then he can break that grip. He can take the soul and the spirit that have come knit together. They're not meant to be, they're meant to be separate things, not entangled. You see, your soul wants to dominate you by getting you to live by your feelings. What someone has done to you, your excuses for why you do what you do or don't do what you know you should do. There is no excuse if you're a child of God. The Lord understands. He understands, but it doesn't excuse it because we have an option. The Holy Spirit of God lives within me. Greater is he that is in me. So whatever is coming against me, whatever stronghold the enemy is trying to get, I need to understand that I am able to be free and to stay free. And when the Lord makes that separation, my spirit can breathe again. And I actually begin to be free and receive all that God so passionately wants me to enjoy. I'm going to ask Tanya to join me. She's going to close with a beautiful song. Jesus promised in Mark 16. Will you read it with me? These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will cast out demons. I believe that simply means that you know who you are. That you know how to live in freedom. That you know how to minister freedom to people around you who are begging for someone to show them how to drive these money changers out of their lives. We're surrounded by people, my friends, they may not say it this way, but their heart cry is, make the noise, stop. Make the chaos stop. The hopelessness, the voices, whatever it may be, we need to be a people of God from whom pure water flows because we live among people who so desperately need freedom. Our world needs deliverance. And my friends, hear me. The people of God, we need to understand that he wants to minister freedom to us on an ongoing basis so that those whom he has set free, that we are truly free. We're not just forgiven of our sins 50 years ago or five years ago, but we're actually walking in the freedom of God and of the Holy Spirit that he brings to us. How many would say, Holy Spirit, thank you for bringing me to Jesus? Amen? And now, Lord, I want to be completely free. I want to be dead to sin. I want to be alive to Jesus Christ. Can you imagine what God will be able to do when his people finally understand who they really are. Can you imagine what he can do? And the Lord is doing that. He's stirring that in the hearts of his people. 
Because you see, even as the people of God sometimes, we can get our eyes so fixated on just the growing, increasing wickedness and bondage of our culture. But you see, if you're not walking with the Lord or you don't have freedom going on in your own life, your only hope is, come Jesus, take me out of this world. And the Lord says, I ain't coming for a while. No, no, I got you in this world for a reason. You are Jesus in this world. You are light in this world. Now get out there and penetrate the darkness. Get out there. Get free yourself. Get free. Now go minister freedom. Amen. Freely you've received. Freely give. Tanya's going to sing this song. We know very well. My Jesus, I love thee. And that first verse is, my Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. Here's the key. And here's the key. For thee. For thee. All the follies. All the foolishness of sin. I resign. I am, I am done with it. And I want to encourage you, my friends, wherever you may be this morning, you may feel like pastor, you may feel like pastor I, I want to be. I just don't, I just don't, don't, feel, anything I just don't anymore. feel anything anymore. I want to repent. I, I, want to repent. I just don't know how. Over the years, friends, there have been, the years, times, friends, there have been times that I've prayed, Lord, I know I need to repent, but I'm just so worn down. I don't need the strength to repent. Would you help me repent? I just, like the Lord saying, I just feel like the Lord saying, Paul, listen, you don't have to do all, you don't the, lifting. Have to do all the lifting. What you have to do, what you have to do is, open the, door is open the door a crack. I'm standing the door. I'm standing the door. Just open it a crack. That's all, all I'm asking you. And I'll begin to pry, and I'll begin it, open. To pry I'll it open. Grace. I'll give you grace. And I'll let the light, and I'll let the light and shine in, and I'll bring you freedom. I'll bring you cleansing. I've come to bring you my peace. The Lord says, but you've got to give it to me. You've got to get serious. You gotta say I'm tired of the passivity. I don't want my kids. This is a motivation for me back in the day. There's been other things. I don't want this junk in my kids' lives. I don't want them growing up with this thing I've been growing up with. I want them to be free. So Lord, start right here. Free me. I repent. Take it away. Cleanse me. And friends, that's not been in our home. It's not been in our home. And that's what the Lord wants to do.